Hi everybody, my name is Rachel Varney. I am the SENCO and one of the trainers at the ADHD Foundation. Thank you for joining me for this webinar. I do hope you're going to find it useful. So I've been asked to talk to you today about strategies to support speech and language in school. My background is um, in teaching. I was a teacher and a SENCO for around 24 years. So the experience that I'm sharing with you today is very much from a school-based perspective. I've been there, I've done it, I've supported. So I do hope you're going to find uh, what I talk about today useful. Okay, so let's get started. So speech, language and communication needs. So when we're talking about that, so most children that we are supporting in schools follow the expected pattern of development. Some, however, do not. Uh, and these children are described as having speech, language and communication needs, or SLCN. So what does this look like? So, so the children you are supporting in your school may have difficulty in one or, one or more areas of SLCN. They may have difficulties ranging from mild to severe in one or more areas. They may have specific needs and massively with this one, therefore should not be considered as doing something wrong. And I know you know that, it's just something to um, promote in your school. They may have an obvious cause of their speech and language and communication needs, you know, for example, a hearing impairment. Um, but also, you know, you know, don't you, you may be working with children and there's no known cause of their speech and language and communication obstacles. So on your screen here is the prevalence of SLCN um, that we are, you know, we, we are seeing in this country. So we think around 10% of children and young people have long term or persistent speech language and communication difficulties. Around 7.6% of children and young people have a primary speech and um, speech language or communication needs, sometimes called uh, DLD, where a child's language ability is not consistent with other their, with their other abilities in other areas of development. And we do know that around 1% of the population have severe or complex speech, language and communication needs. So when we're talking about speech, language and communication needs, this is an area of neurodiversity. Now I'm from the ADHD Foundation, so I find it very hard just to speak about speech, language and communication needs in isolation. So let's just talk briefly about that word neurodiversity. So if you have speech, language and you communication need, you are neurodiverse. Neurodiversity is not an error. It is not a disorder. It's literally just a different way of the brain functioning. It's a difference. Um, and, you know, a neuro, neurodiverse minds are part of human diversity. And we know that around one in five of the population are neurodiverse. So I don't know about your experience in neurodiversity in your setting. You'll probably have lots to talk about there. When we're talking about neurodiversity, when we're talking about any of those different neurodiversities, be it a speech language communication uh, obstacle or ADHD or autism, we know that with any neurodiverse condition, there is this high chance, there is the norm, it's not a possibility, it's more of a norm that there will be co-occurrence. This literally means that if you are uh, supporting a child with speech, language and communication needs, there is a high chance that they are going to have co-occurring conditions, have what may be more, there may be more than, that there may be other neurodiversities there that you may need to unpick. Um, but, you know, we know, don't we, in schools that sometimes this is really, really hard to pursue. Uh, you know, if we if we think that maybe the child that we are supporting with speech or language communication difficulties may there may be co-occurring areas. But we know that in order to pursue diagnosis in another area, for example, ADHD or autism, the waiting list can be really long for this, can't they? But just the reason why I talk about this is because when I was a teacher, when I was a SENCO, you know, when I used to inherit my SEND register, I would see that maybe a child had speech and language uh, difficulties, maybe a child had ADHD, maybe a child was on pathway for an autism assessment. 
And when I first inherited those children, I used to really, really look at them through that lens, through a speech difficulty lens, through an ADHD lens. And I just wished early on in my career, I'd been more aware of that high chance of co-occurrence. So that's just something to consider. The reason why we need to consider that is, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. For example, if you do have a child uh, with um, developmental language difficulties, they have a, you know, um, you know, we need to think about whether there is any other co-occurring conditions there. I like to use this slide. This is our balls in the bucket slide from Do It Profiler from Dr. Amanda Kirby. This is just to be aware for you as a Senko, as a teacher, that, um, you know, some children, they may not meet the threshold to receive a diagnosis in a certain area, but it doesn't mean to say that they still have needs in that area. So I know this slide shows that child A has a diagnosis of dyslexia, and I know we're here today to talk about language difficulties, but just look at child B. They have lots of balls in their buckets, lots of different co-occurring signs going on, but they don't actually meet the threat. They wouldn't meet the threshold to receive a diagnosis in another area. This is just to be aware for you as a teacher, as a Senko in your setting, that there are children that do not meet the threshold to receive a diagnosis in certain areas, but it doesn't mean to say that their need isn't there. So that's just something to consider. So let's talk. So we're here today to talk about speech, language and communication difficulties. So here on your screen, these are just some signs to look out for. So if your child with speech, language and communication difficulties, um, you know, they're displaying signs of need, you may see them in other areas as well. So, of course, you may hear it in their speech. Or, or detect that their speech is disjointed, but also they may be showing signs as far as their behaviour is concerned. Now, when we use that word behaviour, it's it. I think behaviour is a, a way of communicating, but maybe due to maybe feeling frustrated or anxious over their speech or language or communication obstacles, they may be displaying this through certain behaviours. There may be all, that child may also be experiencing difficulties in social interaction and relationships. You may see difficulties um, manifesting in their written work, in their literacy, maybe even their play, depending on the age of the child. The language, of course, they use and how they communicate. Are they communicating in other ways, like nonverbal ways, like around, you know, the way they um, interact with other children um, or other staff? So these are just other signs to look out for if you are thinking about a child that may be experiencing difficulties with their speech or language or communication. So we so speech, language and communication are central to so many things in our in the learning environment and in life so it, it the, to, in order to to thrive in other areas it is essential that their speech and language and communication are supported and developed if not you can see an impact in their learning as i said in their behavior their emotional development and their social development. So let's unpick that a little bit more. So if we think about a child's learning, language, communication, interaction is key. Um, learning is a social and interactive process, massively dependent on language. We Children learn through play, don't they? And the, all those language and communication, they need that, don't they? Literacy is a vehicle for learning, also is language. Learning depends on making sense of new information and language is required to resolve problems. <clears throat> if we think about behavior, that communication, in order to be able you know, to thrive, we need language 
to follow rules and understand cause and effect of consequences. Language communication, it, language communication supports self-regulation, that stress response in our children. And it also helps us to deal with conflict, which is part and parcel, isn't it, of a child's development, all of, all of those things. As far as social development is concerned, communication is people using speech and language whilst interacting socially with others. It helps us to make, keep, make and keep friends. It helps us to understand the rules of interaction and conversation. It helps us with our nonverbal clue, clue, sorry, can't speak today, nonverbal communication. So all those things that we communicate through our body language. It helps us to interact with others and it helps us to establish an understanding of the rules of society, the rules in school and socially. As far as emotional and development, development and mental well-being, speech, strong speech, language and communication help to promote empathy. It gives us confidence and self-esteem. It helps us build resilience and it helps us to understand and control our own emotions, self-regulation. So this is just a quote from the Public Health England. I'm sorry, it's, um, it's 2016, uh, but I think it's still very, very relevant. Um, so communication skills are important in building relationships, in understanding, expression, expressing feelings and emotions and problem solving. Good communication skills are identified as supporting resilience when it comes to mental health which is key, isn't it, when we're thinking about how we are going to enable our children, our young people to thrive. With resilience comes confidence, and with confidence helps support emotional development. So how do speech and language communication skills support that development? So when we're thinking, when we're thinking about learning, good speech and language are the foundation on which literacy is developed. Children and young people need to be able to understand and respond to what is being taught within their learning environment at their level. Um, as, as far as supporting behaviour is concerned, language and communication skills um, are needed to understand cause, effect and consequence. If a child or a young person can't use language to talk things through, there's a high chance, isn't it, that they're going to become frustrated, fr frustrated, they may become dysregulated and really impact on their self-esteem. If we think about how speech and language communication supports emotional development, children or young people with speech, language and communication um, obstacles may have more poor confidence and low self-esteem as a result of their needs. Language, language allows us to understand our own and other people's emotions. If we think about how it supports social development, we use our language and communication skills to establish and maintain relationships with others. And we use it to understand rules, and games. I can't believe I'm talking about language so much today. My, lang my, my speech seems to be all over the place today. I do apologise. <laughs> so when we're thinking about kind of, uh, you know, those goals for children, when we're thinking about the, the children that we are supporting in schools, um, as far as their speech and language and communication development is, where should they be? Where are those goals? What are we looking at? Where are we gauging whether there is a delay or a difficulty? So these are just a few signs to look out for. So a child of five should be able to understand a two to three part spoken instruction. For example, hang your, water, hang your coat up, hang your coat up, that should say, get your water bottle and sit down. By seven. A child should be able to understand complex two to three part instructions. For example, who's the character describing in chapter three of the book? How do you think they feel to, and how do you think they feel towards that person? 
by nine year, years old, around year four, we should see uh, developmentally a child being able to infer meaning, reasoning and make predictions. So this is very, very much, and if you think about the English curriculum, you know, so these are kind of, you know, by year one, two, by year three and by year four, we, you know, there should be a strong gra grasp of inference inference and we know don't we if we have taught in year three or year four you know that is that that's kind of a golden thread through uh, the supporting of reading it's not just about what the children child is reading those inference skills that's when we see them really really develop and then by 11 year six year seven a neurotypical child so this is this is there's a bit of a health check with this one so we're thinking about a child that um, is neurotypical so maybe isn't it showing any other signs, any any other signs of neurodiverse conditions, especially around autism? By 11, a child should be able to appreciate sarcasm when it's obvious, but just be wary there. So think back to what I said about co-occurrence. If you have a, if you are supporting a child around 11, 12, 13, um, and you are you are seeing signs of maybe some speech and language difficulties. Do be aware of co-occurrence there. We wouldn't expect it if a child is autistic to be able to maybe appreciate sarcasm. So just be, be careful with that one. Another massive thing that we need to talk about when we are talking about speech and language and communication obstacles is our bilingual learners. So the first 10 years of my career, I taught predominantly um, children that, that had English as their additional language um, and that taught me a, an awful lot about how about how I communicate with my pupils um, not assuming that they understood thing one way so it really it really really was a it really helped develop my skills as a teacher as well but I know sometimes some of those EAL children English as additional language children because they were learning a second language sometimes colleagues would come up and say i think they've got some difficulties with their speech now i know you you know here today you know we are very very experienced with supporting eal learners but maybe thinking about how we are going to promote this in the schools that we are in so this is just a few a few slides just to you know to highlight um you know our amazing bilingual learners. So children who are learning more than one language will broadly develop their skills in the same way as monolingual learners. Speakers, sorry, but they are but they are some important, massively important things to consider when supporting children or young people who are learning more than one language. Bilingualism is an amazing asset with many, many associated advantages. Advantages have been shown in many ways, including interaction and education. A child's home language has an important and continuing role throughout their learning. It should be acknowledged, it should be supported, it should be celebrated, and encouraged and we see this a lot in schools so you know like dual language dual language labeling so we're celebrating the home language but also you know just to be you know it's it's something um it, it should their home language should massively be encouraged there's many many reasons for this uh, but you know just to just to bear in mind that if a child is strong uh uh their language is strong in their home language you know um there is a, that that shows that there isn't a speech and language and communication difficulty they are just learning a second language which is absolutely amazing i wish i could learn it as quick so just to bear in mind there will be a natural time um, of absorbing and understanding a second language before speaking it and we can and I suppose we can relate to this with um, our toddlers you know so before a toddler speaks they absorb the language around them the communication around them um, of around two years so if you inherit a child 
um, who is learning English as their second language, especially if they're new maybe to English, it's going to take them around two years to be able to absorb, process, understand, and then be competent to speak in that second language. So just to be aware of that. But all that aside, it is important to acknowledge that some of our English as an additional language learners could still have speech and language and communication needs. Um, this is where I think it's really, really important, if possible, if you have access to it, to get to the first thing to do is to kind of get an assessment, um, a speech and language assessment in their home language. This is this is a great first port of call. If you are concerned about a child in your setting who has English as an additional language, who you feel also may have speech and language and communication difficulties. I think the first port of call, of course, a, a, a hearing, um, a hearing test as well, but also an assessment of um, their home language. I think that that's that's really powerful and, and quite crucial, really. So here are just some steps to consider with our bilingual learners. So um, skills. Um, develop by the same means, whatever the language. Mixing words from both languages and sentence is normal um, of uh, bilingual language development. All language have a typical developmental pattern, but patterns may vary depending on the language. That's why sometimes I think in the past I can think about children, some of my uh, EAL children, you know, maybe sometimes getting their tenses or their sentence structure um, mixed up in English because maybe it didn't follow the same pattern in their home language. And as I said in the last slide, becoming conversationally fluent, and fluent in a second language usually takes around two years. Bil I can't emphasise enough, you know, bilingualism is, an, is a massive advantage. And we need to also consider as practitioners, teachers, senkos, we need to encourage parents in whatever language um, sorry, a typo there, they fell. They feel most comfortable in. So, you know, thinking about parents' evenings, um, communication with home, you know, um, as much as possible, we need to uh, support the parents in speaking whichever language they feel most confident in. I don't know what it's like in your setting, but the settings where I've um, taught in the past, we had um, uh, interpreters or maybe. Um, uh, we, you know, sometimes you can get, uh, you can access support from the local authority for this. So just something to bear in mind, really. So why do we need to support children's speech, language and communication? So there's three main areas. So speech, language and communication are vital foundations for other areas of development. I think I said that before. These skills are still developing during the, so speech, language and communication skills are still developing during the primary use, year, sorry. A huge amount of receptive and expressive language takes place between the ages of five and 11. That's where we see an explosion in vocabulary and the grammatical structure needed to form more complex narratives, both spoken and written. So that's just something to bear in mind. And also speech and speech language and communication are central to children's ongoing development into secondary school and into adulthood. These are life skills, aren't they? So, so much of what happens within the school environment has speech and language and communication at its core. It's true, isn't it? Difficulties with speech, language and communication can have an impact on social, as I said, social and emotional development, confidence, self-esteem, learning behaviour and academic achievement. I know that's, you know, you know, in schools, that's what, you know, that's that's our aim, isn't it? But I think that academic achievement can only come when there is strong foundations around social and emotional development, confidence, self-esteem. So here are some just some, some key principles on how we 
as practitioners, teachers, senkos can support in class. Now, these are very, very much thinking about, at, um, you know, a whole, you know, thinking about the whole class. So, you know, some of these principles, you know, these aren't just going to help maybe those children that we think may or do have speech and language communication difficulties. These, these are great, you know, this, this, I think this is just, this is just like, this is part of our quality first teaching approach that we kind of do without even realising. Sorry. So whether we're working with toddlers, children, young people, I think we need to listen and value the contributions that they make and respond to what they say or the questions we ask. So if we feel that a child has speech and language and communication difficulties or other areas of ND, we do need to consider processing time. Now, I was, as I said, I was a teacher for many, many years, you know, you know, when I was, you know, those pacey lessons that our senior leaders are looking for, that we know that, you know, that's what we should be. That's our ultimate goal, isn't it? Pacey, interactive fast paced lessons but that doesn't suit all our learners and i think and we know this as well the certain individuals in our class the cohorts that we teach that need more processing time um and you know this is this is massive for you know especially if we know that children are struggling with their speech or language or communication or communication so uh there was lots of strategies i used to use here sometimes i would kind of give children i'd say i'm going to ask you in I'm going to ask two children, then I'm going to come back to you. So thinking time, processing time. Sometimes if I asked a question, I, I would, and it, it seems like a long, long time, count to 10 in my head. Also, maybe if we do know that there's individuals that struggle with that question and answer thing, can they have access to learning partners or another um, adult in the class? You know, things like whispering devices, things like that. But processing time is massive. Um, I think, you know, if you are worried about maybe what people are going to think when they're walking past your class and you, they hear you speak and then there's quiet. I just think, you know, if we if you do keep any kind of logs of lessons or, you know, maybe within a child's pupil profile, uh, you know, just, you know, one of those one of your key targets could be allow Aiden processing time or consider processing time for Hallie. Um, I think as long as you're explicit about it, I think it's, it's it, you know, it's a great, you know, you're adapting your teaching, aren't you? I think we need to be try to be careful with questions and uh, comment on what the child is doing and allow time to lead where possible. Maybe, and I think we do this naturally, add an extra word or extend what a child has said, build additional complexity into what they have said model good communication we do this in our sleep don't we we do this without even realizing make the most of opportunities through the daily routines to incorporate speech and language and communication make language learning fun so for even and i'm not just talking about our younger children here you know use songs and rhymes wherever possible i i um you know you know when we're learning about you know uh, the periodic table or things like that we can incorporate things like that even into um our uh, secondary schools as well working with part so working with parents and carers as well massively they can you know so say they can massively reinforce what you're trying to achieve at home can't they and can and consider current skills in speech and language and communication and how you can support next steps so i think especially as teachers we know exactly where our children are at how can we just like drip feed next steps extending on their vocabulary into their learning so this leads us on to how we can how we can support and extend speech language and communication and there's two main um vehicles that we can use here i think we can use adapting or scaffolding skills so when we're thinking about adapting adapting the way that we talk to children has a massive impact on both what the child understands and what they say um, and I think back here to, uh, you know, linking this with our EAL learners and I think teachers do this really, really well, not assuming, and especially for our ND children as well, not assuming that they've understood something one way. I think teachers were great at, um, you know, maybe um, saying things 
in a couple of ways using um, objects of reference, visuals, things like that. Um, but so, so you know, there's the, and there's different. So there's other ways as well. So we can think about the the complexity of our language or the use of questioning. So here are just some other key points to adapting language. So how um, how many and what questions you ask, do we need to reduce that? How complex our sentences are, how much we talk, uh, what spaces there are for children to use language. So, so that's kind of about thinking about your classroom. Do we have group talks? Do we have talking partners? Is language, is the use of language promoted? Are we, are they allowed to talk quietly to each other? I know sometimes we need quiet in the class, but you know, but thinking about those children, our ND children, those children that are developing those speech and language skills, think about ways that we can incorporate that into all, us, all areas of our class. Thinking about really just being aware of how, sent, how long our sentences are and how many new or complex words we are using. So here are just some points to adapting language. It's important to have a good sense, and I, I think we do this, we, we know this, don't we? A good sense of where the child's language level is so that we as practitioners are aware of where further explanation is required. I mentioned visuals. You, I think visuals can be key, non-verbal cues. Uh, so, you know, so hand gestures, um, you know, and they're great for our uh, other areas of ND as well. Concrete objects, um, objects of reference for reinforcement. This can be really, really useful. Do consider your types of questions. Uh, you know, um, just be aware of the complexity of them. Um, and also consider comments sometimes and not questions. So just commenting on what the child has said not questioning it. That could just help to um, uh, um, reinforce what the child has said. So as far as scaffolding is concerned, this is a this is this is you know this is a further uh, um, approach. Um, it describes how we as the practitioners provide support to enable children to achieve and develop their skills. So it builds on what the child can already do offering support to move their skills on gradually and it offers temporary support so that the child is successful and can then do things by themselves without support. Another thing to consider is that work with parents and carers. It's, I think it's really really important uh, you know sometimes you know they, they're using things at home that we haven't considered or things that they know work so listen if we have concerns about a child you know share them with the parents, see what their their, you know, what do they use at home. Um, and I, you know, um especially with our a lot of our ND children, sometimes they present differently at home and at school. So I think that's why it's really, really important to try and involve parents or carers if there are concerns over speech and language and communication. You do this through many like kind of uh, you know, many avenues, um, you know, maybe, you know, like, have we got an afternoon where we can invite the parents into the classroom? This sometimes helps the parents to realise, to see the differences with their child's language and their peers' language, maybe coffee morning. So, you know, so it's just, a, it's a, it's a nice, uh, calm way of just talking about and unpicking where the child needs support or where they may um, benefit from support. Thinking about the classroom environment as well, this can really, really help support, this can help support or impact, excuse me, on uh, speech and language and development uh, communication. So thinking about the noise level in class, so, so, you know, so say, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, encouraging children to speak at the using the right volume. Even thinking about la lighting, if our children are also quite sensitive to have any sensory sensitivities, lighting can sometimes impact on that communication. Visual supports are great, as I said. Um, and just think about in your classroom, what opportunities are there for speech? for language development 
and also communication. Uh, sometimes a child who is experiencing speech, language and communication difficulties could have a difficulty with them, uh, you know, you know, uh, they could be, um, because of them, they could be also experiencing difficulties uh, with re retaining information memory. So we could help really consider helping to develop memory strategies as well. So um, encouraging the child or the young person to generate examples. Sequential maps are, are great at helping. So say, so, you know, if your child, maybe if, if the child is having to write a report or a story or something, a sequential, if, and if there is language difficulties, a sequential map is going to really, really help support and prompt those different um, areas. Keywords, that can be really, really helpful. Um, asking uh, the young person to teach you, the teacher. Multi-sensory and active learning, flashcards and images, and uh, I think I mentioned rhymes and songs earlier. But just be, you know, so, you know, with those speech and language and communication difficulties because of them it may also impact on memory and, and the child may require more prompts and this is going to help um this and you know the these these kind of strategies you know these are these are useful whole whole class strategies anyway aren't they so when we're thinking about pro promoting that vocabulary development here are just some ideas on your screen so I do think to be you, you need to be aware of introducing, you know, the amount of words that you produce, the, uh, uh, um, sorry, the amounts of new vocabulary, of, sorry, I can't speak, the new vocabulary that you um, introduce. Does that need to be reduced for any of our children with speech, language and communication difficulties? Maybe give uh, this, the student a target list of vocabulary prior to the lesson. Explain the words. Um, explain the word in the language the child understands. So that multi-sensory approach, see it, hear it, say it, read it, write it. Focus on words which will be more meaningful, motivating or useful to the students. Visual strategies, um, again encouraging the, the student to explain what words mean, so putting it into their own words. Uh, uh, reinforce words regularly over time, over a period of time. So try to dip it into other areas of their learning. Um, and as much as possible, you know, this is our ultimate, isn't it? Encouraging our young person to use these strategies independently. Here are just some ideas to support expressive language skills. So processing time, I think I've spoken about that quite a lot. Try as much as possible to avoid finishing the child's sentences, give them time. Repeat back what the student has said clearly. So sometimes, you know, um, if maybe if they haven't um, said the word correctly, if we just mirror it back to them, uh, that can be really supportive. Um, maybe if, if, if the child or young person is struggling with the word, can we give them, uh, try giving them prompts? Try to ask open-ended questions encourage as much as possible the child or the young person to uh, self-monitor their use of vocabulary grad but this has to be gradually over time um and we need to do you know these these can all impact on their written language so just to be aware of that so many of our children with speech language and communication difficulties you know will struggle socially as well so these are just some um, ideas here to promote effective communication and develop those social skills. So for us, be, be the model. You know, if we can um, model posture, uh, maybe um, not so much eye contact, because, you know, a lot of our neurodiverse children struggle with eye contact, but maybe just like maybe getting down to the child's level, but we're still giving them space. Be really clear, be very aware of your own speech and language, uh, you know, um, model, um, you know, um, you know, you know, so say so, the talking partners is a great way of doing this model, you know, like those nonverbal cues like nodding if somebody says something or those are so not uh, 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 
um, altering your head or you know um, hand gestures things like that um, and I think this um, and, and so that's their nonverbal cues but also good listening skills as well these are all going to help promote better effective communication for those children who may be struggling with their speech and language and communication when we think of those children that um, are still struggling with the clarity of their speech there's a few do's and don'ts here so I think and again I think teachers practitioners we're really great at doing this but just to be you know to, to promote this in your school as well so I think we really need to you know promote listening to what the child has said and try to kind of not to avoid like so it's, it's what they've said not how they've said it uh, maybe repeating back repeating back words correctly so they hear good examples but not saying no you didn't say it wrong um massive don'ts avoid asking questions um avoid asking to re repeat words that we know that they find difficult avoid correcting speech so notes notes it's rachel's turn so it's just you know uh, so just try to um try to avoid the no's the don'ts um and try to avoid and pretending to understand instead if you are really unclear ask the child to show you or point to it or mime it things like that so for a child that we know is having difficulties with their speech language and communication it's really important for us as practitioners to start build evidence if we are going to kind of pursue outside agency support so there's a number of different resources available to help us recognize speech and language and communication needs and i'm not here to promote any in particular but there's lots and lots out there i'm going to share some of my personal ones um, in a moment but these the the resources tend to take two different approaches so gauging the ages and stages of the child or young person and observation the observation approach so thinking about folk thinking um reflecting on what the chat what would you expect from the child at that age um, and then maybe trying to identify so if they're not at the stage that they should be identifying what stage they are at and there's lots of resources that can help us do this and of course you know following that seeking advice to support uh, you know I think it's essential if we know that there, a child is not at the correct age or stage as far as speech language and communication is concerned that's when we need to pursue outside agency report outside agency support so for that you know we need to consider things like what have we got on our local offer as far as our local offer is concerned what can be provided there uh, you know speech and i think if there is a real delay um it, you know because speech language and communication is like a golden thread through everything that a child does if we can if we have access to a speech and language therapist that's going to really really help but also thinking back to those our EAL learners, if we are concerned um, a, for a child who is new to English or is learning English as a different like additional language, massively we do need to try to um, facilitate that first language assessment. And depending on your local authority, you may have different avenues to be able to pursue that. Resources that I've personally used in the past, so I've just I've put them in here. I'm not promoting any in particular. You know, I know you will have your own ones, but these are the ones that personally I've used in the past that I've loved. I've used loads more, but these are the ones that I've particularly really, really found effective. So Time to Talk is for like early years in Key Stage 1, and it's a lovely way of promoting speech language and social skills. I think it's really, really effective and it can be done as, on a group level. Uh, and I've just just found it really, really powerful and a great, um, a great way of um, linking with families as well. There's loads and loads of resources, excuse me, from the Elkland website and they also um, facilitate courses as well. A absolutely amazing resources. From many speech and language therapists that I've worked with in the past, um, they have um, uh, provided uh, resources from Black Sheep, and that's that's quite a that's um, that's quite a good step by step program to go through. And then finally, the one that I do think is really really great to gauge those ages and stages of a child and clear next steps is the Wellcome materials. 
uh, from GL assessments. They're my personal ones. I know you will have your own ones. The reason why I put those in kind of now is just if you know you know a lot of what I've talked about is what we can do proactively in class but we know sometimes that children do need additional support to that quality first teaching. I think it's really really important to consider if we are if we have a child who is struggling with their speech with their language or communication that can cause quite high anxiety for the child frustration upset so where possible, and I think this is, this is good general practice for our ND children and other children, if we can think of maybe having some self-regulation spaces within our settings, this can really, really help. And also a great way, if they are getting frustrated or anxious around their difficulties with their speech and language, I think there's some great apps out there that can really, really help to calm them down and support that self-regulation and here are just some of the ones again that I've used in the past that I do think are really really useful um, but again I know you will have your own ones as well. Um, an unapologetic plug here, uh, the ADHD Foundation has an umbrella project each year and we are launching our 2023 one at the moment so if you do wish to be part of this amazing project that runs up and down the country, please do get in contact with us at the ADHD Foundation. It looks fab and it's a great way of promoting all the amazing pluses of neurodiversity. So thank you for today. I do hope you found this session useful. There is my email address at the top of the page. If you um, have any questions following this, please get in contact. And also there are social media links as well there. So thank you. And hopefully I will see you soon. Take care. Goodbye.